three photographers from three different time zones, all connected by night photography and all shooting with the Pentax K1. We are the Night Taxians. Tim, you were the first one to start using a Pentax of of any kind out of the three of us. So how did you how did you come about uh, using it? How did you find out about it, and why did you start using it? All right, I'm going to answer that question, but I'm going to preface it with I know I'm probably going to say something that's going to upset someone who really loves Canon, and I don't mean <laughs> to, but there <laughs> there's a reason, you know. I as you know, I've always been very adamant that whatever you have is what you have. And if you love it, good for you. I'm never mm -hmm. going to try to talk you out of what you have because everybody buys something for a particular reason that works for them. That's my little, um, I guess, I guess that's my disclaimer just in case. But, Canon uh, users. We love you. Yeah. I, no problem. I have a Canon 7D from a uh, 7D, not 70D from 2010. I still use it occasionally. It's a great camera. Um, I didn't know, I didn't know the K1 existed until, um, someone walked into my office in my, in my previous life, I was a, um, a, a bank manager and I, I had all sorts of different customers come in, but they all knew that I did a lot with photography. And one of them was a photographer. His name is, uh, Dan Catrona. And, uh, he, he was doing some work for the, I think Cape Cod times, uh, at that moment, this was back in probably 2016. Right. And he says, Oh, he goes, I found something that you would absolutely love. And, um, it's this Pentax and it does all these cool things with nighttime stuff. And I know you would love it. And I said, Oh, can you bring it? He goes, well, actually I returned it. And I said, <laughs> well, well, That's why are you telling me about sale. this then? Yeah. So, so he says, he says, to be honest with you, just didn't have a fast enough frame rate. He does a lot of sports stuff, I think too, where he just wanted something with a, a fast, um, uh, uh, frames per second and K one's not really there compared to a lot of other cameras, but he goes for you, it's probably going to be perfect because what do you shoot? I said, probably one shot every three to five minutes. <laughs> so should be fast enough for me. <laughs> But yeah. he, he had told me all the features. He mentioned the Astro Tracer, not by name. He's just like, oh, the sensor will track the sky. I didn't know anything about the Pentax terminology at the time. Um, I'd been shooting with a Canon 6D, but I was right about at the point where I was thinking it was time for me to get a new camera because I think I got the 6D in 2012 or so. So we're going on about four years. And I was waiting for the 6D Mark II to come out. And the 5D Mark IV, I think it just came out, but very expensive body. And, uh, and I was really intrigued by the K1's Astro Tracer functionality, as well as some of the other things like the body lighting on there and the, the red screen that you can enable in the menu if you want to mm -hmm. preserve your night vision, right? Uh, which I, I don't actually use a ton because it also makes your, your picture previews red, but red. that's a whole yeah. other story. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I started looking at it and I thought, wow, this is a, actually a really, really nice looking unit. It's got a lot of physical buttons and I love physical buttons. I'm not a big menu driven kind of guy. And so I, I decided one day to go out on a B and H in uh, New York uh, because I can hop a train from near uh, where my mother lives out in the Berkshires and get there in about two hours. And I walked in and I found that the person who was helping me knew just about as much uh, regarding Pentax as I had researched in the last three days. So um, he just kind of left me with it and I messed around with it. And I said, yeah, I, I, I really like this. Then I went and did all my due diligence of research um, specific to night photography, couldn't find a ton. And by night photography, I'm defining that as long exposure, moonlight and astro work. Right. There was, right. there was some, what, what I found a lot uh, in my research was older, older models of Pentax using the astro trace and, and some of the night work. And I was impressed with that. Too. Yeah. Um, but to be honest with you, what really kind of sold me on it. And there's a pun intended on that was the price. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Because I I paid uh eighteen ninety nine for I think for the sixty and then the five D Mark IV was coming out and that was like around three grand and then this body at the <clears> time <throat> I think was seventeen ninety nine with that built in tracking ability with all those nice little nighttime convenience functions correct uh, yeah yeah and um 
I ended up going, buying the package. I got the uh, 15 to 30 and the uh, the K1 together. I think it came in at around three because I needed the lens since I was moving over systems. Moving but, everything. Yeah, but I, I, I was really, really impressed with the price point for what the features were. And keeping in mind too, that I was moving from that sensor in the 6D, which was a 20 megapixel, pretty well respected for low light photography. Yeah, um, to a 36.6. Yeah, which I think is the this. You correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the same sensor they they were putting in the the Nikon D810s, um, mm -hmm. which was very highly regarded. But uh, Pentax had their own secret sauce in the uh, the processing part. Uh, I was just I was thrilled with it. It was a zero regret purchase. And, and then, actually, I was going to touch upon that later when I talked about um, you know some of the reasons that I chose it. But since you brought that up. Um, What's really strange about um, comparing the Pentax K1 to the 810 is that somehow, according to DxO Mark, if they can be believed, the Pentax K1 actually has a greater dynamic range. I have heard this. Yeah. So Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So it's um, greater dynamic range than a D810 or a Sony A7R. And um, it, it, this is all between um, l relatively low um, ISOs, but it's, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, 100 to 800. And um, it scores higher than a D750, which is the other camera that I use. So anyway, uh, I just thought I'd interject that. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it, it makes complete sense. And I notice it when I'm doing a lot of my work because with the 6D, if I tried to push it a little bit too much, you'd start to see that color banding. You know the purples right. and the blues and the stripes yeah. and so on, and uh, I don't I don't ever see that with the no. K one within the reason of what I'm I'm doing. Obviously, I'm not taking a black image and moving it up several stops. But no, but if I was, it's properly exposed, it doesn't seem to do that, or you know, at least considerably less than other cameras. You know, right? Yeah, and then of course I got it and I started just singing its praises. I mean, I was I was hooked at that point. I went out and got a couple more lenses. And um, I just found that any time I had the opportunity to go out with that particular camera, I just got really excited about having this this unit. I, I, you know, I'm on my second one now because of some malarkey <laughs> I did to my first one <laughs> involving pavement. But uh, even to this day, and now we're in 2022, and my I got the first one in 20 early 2017, late 2016, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. I still just absolutely love using it. It, it, it's, it. For me, it's the difference between just having a tool that you're using to accomplish a mission and then also having this thing and you're like, I really like messing around with this this unit. You know, I mean, all the all the, all the the buttons and the functionality, I, I like physical buttons because at night, it's just, I find it easier to know your camera rather than go through a menu system. I don't like looking at the menu too much if I don't have to. No, um, but I'm getting ahead of myself on this. But anyway, the point is that um, <clears throat> that's how I got into it. It was because somebody else who couldn't use it for what they needed it for thought it would be a perfect fit for me. And that led me down the the rabbit hole. The rabbit hole. Zero regrets to this day. <laughs> and then, as you know, I, of course, went and started telling everybody how amazing I thought this camera was oh, yeah. To, yeah. to the point where I thought maybe I, I should get hired as a rep or something. But um, <laughs> I, I think it should some... definitely give you a kickback. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Hmm. Pentax, if you're listening, because uh, I think I have gotten at least two people I know on board, possibly, <laughs> possibly more. <laughs> I think that the 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 first person after me was you, Ken, right? Because I had blown up your head with all of this amazingness. It's true and i think mike and i got it at about the same time but um yeah yeah it was pretty it was close. pretty close but um so i can i can tell you a little bit about um how i came came about it as well so predating this like around 2012 i ran into someone named carl bernhard whom i'm still in facebook contact with um in joshua tree national park and carl was raving about his Pentax, um, which at the time was an APS-C sensor camera, and I don't remember which one he had, but he was talking about the Astro Tracer and how the sensor uh, shifts with the stars and follows the stars along. And his his photos looked really good. And so I was, you know, quite intrigued, but I thought, okay, it is an APS-C 
sensor and I'm interested at the time I was shooting with a D7000 which was also APS-C but I was really interested in um going full frame so so I was interested but then when the K1 came out I really really started becoming interesting interested in this and at the time Hal Mitzenmacher and you started telling me about it saying oh my gosh this this camera is super great and of course it's full frame so i was really really interested in this but i also didn't have enough money so about i think 2000 either late 2018 or 2019 i finally found that i could purchase a k1 used so i picked one up for 900 dollars, and then i picked up a 15 to 30 for about the same amount of money and so for eighteen hundred dollars i had this this amazing kit and then since then i've just you know slowly accumulated more lenses but um i'm so happy with the pentax for really all the reasons you said and i'll add to that the image quality i'll slip this in here as well there's this you know specs aside whether you believe dxo mark or not there's an openness about the 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 images that I'm getting straight out of camera that that I find really appealing and I don't know how to quantify that but but it's this beautiful openness that I really like I like the way it handles dynamic range color but it just feels open and I I know that's not very scientific but you know that's what I've got <laughs> Well <laughs> it's the it's the Ken scale That's right that's fine <laughs> Yeah so Mike what's your story uh, so my story is uh, really somewhat similar in that I really had never heard of, honestly, I'd never really heard of Pentex hardly at all other than, you know, they were cameras from way back when. And <laughs> uh, so when, uh, shortly after Tim got his, when we were in Pennsylvania, Tim was using it, and of course, she was raving about how great it was. And I remember standing next to him at one point when he took a picture. And before he actually opened the shutter, I remember looking at the screen, his live view screen, and thinking, holy crap, my yeah. Nikon doesn't show anything like this. No, you know, the Nikon's practically dark. Yeah, Nikon and here live I'm looking views. At the, the Pentax, and it's like, oh my God. Yeah, it's actually usable. Detail in it. Yeah, yeah. And so I really started thinking pretty hard about it then. Uh, I guess that was probably 2017, maybe. Mm. And then around, I'm gonna guess maybe 2019, I started thinking about it pretty hard, and uh, I started looking for like a used one. Uh, and I found. I came across a guy on eBay that had like an, like you're saying, Ken, I, he had like an entire kit. He had uh, a K1. It had, I think it had a really low shutter count. I can't remember what it was, but he had the K1. He had a 15 by 30. Uh, he had, I think, a 50 millimeter. Mm. Uh, F1.4 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I think he had another lens, and then he had a battery grip, and and it had he it came with like a Pelican case also. Oh, and I think I picked the whole setup for I don't know maybe two grand. Oh, that's so great. And so then as soon as it showed up, I sold the whatever it was the fifty millimeter. I sold the battery grip. I literally I sold everything but the K one and the fifteen millimeter and. and mm. I, I I probably jinxed myself and offended the Nikon gods because literally like the next time I went out with my Nikon, because I hadn't really gotten myself familiar with the Pentex, the next time I went out, I was gone on a weekend, and that Friday night, my Nikon fell off the tripod. Wow. Yeah, it didn't like that Pentax. It didn't like I said, that. Yeah, I'll show so you. I had... I had the Nikon fixed, and then I sold my Nikon and the lens I had with it. You had a D810 before, right? I had an 800. I oh, had an 800. 800. Okay. Yeah, about the same. 
Yeah, they're almost identical. Yeah. I remember that. I remember when that happened. You were not happy about that. I was not. That was literally like the first... When it fell off, I'd taken three or four photos, one setup, and then it fell off. And I had literally, I had two, three hours worth of shooting planned that night. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'd even stopped at uh, a house before I'd gone to where I had dropped it and looked at the house and thought about how to shoot it. And I was really stoked about going there. And then it bounced off the pavement and I had to drive back to the motel and cry my sorrows. Now, I just want to, you know, point out here that we've had two people talk about bouncing cameras off pavement so far. (laughs) That's true. It's not because of anger management issues. No, no, no. It's strictly (laughs) accidental. Although there was anger afterwards. Yes, there was a lot of anger. Yeah. 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 Well, I did, I did to my Pentax, what you did to your, your Nikon. It just right. fell right off the tripod and it happened yeah. in extreme slow motion, but slightly faster than I could react. So yep. uh-huh. yeah, we've hit across a lot of features at this point, but um, there's probably still uh, other features we've hit on uh, image quality cost and things like that. But features for night photographers, you know, we're night taxians, so we need to talk about this. So we have body illumination, which is um, what Tim mentioned. And so this is, um, for those people who don't know, this, these are LED lights that illuminate various parts of the camera body. And you press a button and, and it back illuminates everything. So this is, you know, obviously really huge for people who don't have their camera memorized, especially. But I suspect that you two probably have most of your buttons memorized by now. But it's still nice to have. Okay, all right. Yeah. Okay, I, I do. I I think yeah. I do. That that's one of those things I try to figure out fairly soon because uh, I just I don't like to fumble around with flashlights if I I, I can avoid oh, it. Oh no, 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 no. You know, but but there's certain buttons that you're just using all the all the time. But and, to that illumination, just to give a little bit more detail on it, there's four LEDs directly behind the screen that comes, you know, the screen pulls out. Yeah. 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 And then those little LEDs are on the back sides of that. And so those lights then shine onto the back of the camera and all the buttons around, which is just like genius placement. Really is. is. Yeah. That's the thing about pen. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, and it's got two, two uh, settings, I think like a high and a low. So you can even Mm. uh, tweak the light a little bit. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to say that it just seems like Pentax put a lot of thought into what photographers need, including night photographers. And that's pretty mm-hmm. remarkable considering that we're sort of a, a somewhat niche form of photography. But for them to do that is really remarkable. There's even a small light that illuminates the lens mount, too. So, I mean. Yeah, that's... and there's one in the uh, the SD card slots. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's remarkable. So let's see, we uh, touched upon the Astro Tracer, but to the best of my knowledge, Tim is the only one who uses this on a regular basis out of the three of us. Yeah, yeah, I don't. I keep thinking I need to start using it, but I haven't yet. Yeah, but um, Tim was interviewed by PhotoFocus um, because he's quite gifted at using the Astro Tracer. So look for a couple of his articles in there. I will put them in the links below and I'll link a video I did about Astro Tracer related to, to my kind of night photography. It is a fantastic feature and it it is such a, um, unknown feature. Uh, You know, I shoot with a lot of people and they always want to know what I'm shooting with. And we talk about trackers. And when I tell them that essentially it's built into the camera, they're just, they're just in disbelief because they've, they've never heard of it. For people who aren't familiar with uh, with the Astro Tracer, it's basically an in-camera star tracker. So it's somewhat similar to an equatorial mount, but instead the sensor is moving along with the stars. And so this allows night photographers to shoot longer exposures without star trailing and obviously without bringing a separate equatorial mount or tracker. So, so the idea 
is that it uh, synchroni- it synchronizes via GPS. Although in the in the new Pentax K3, you don't even have to do that. And I'd like to see this tech come to uh, a firmware update with the K1, but uh, that's I guess still forthcoming. So. Yeah, I would. But, it would certainly trim down the uh, the setup time. Yeah, it would trim that down. But but the tracker allows allows you to use a lower ISO and then achieve more accurate color rendering in the stars. Uh, so so there's that, and then obviously you can save money uh, because you don't have to buy and you know, uh, set up. Yeah, yeah. So that's awfully nice. And for 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 our form of photography in particular where we're traipsing all over the place, whether it's abandoned places or, or landscape, we want to travel light. So, you know, not having to set up equatorial mounts is, is pretty big and not having to, you know, haul them around in our backpack. So. Right. And and of course it's, it's not a full replacement for those types of of mounts, especially for people who might be interested in doing like 10 minutes of stars or, if you're going to do like some, some deep sky stuff, perhaps because, um, it ha- it does have some limitations, but you right. know, if you're then astro, astro landscape photography, where you're doing the Milky way over something and you're shooting with a wide angle lens, um, it's going to work quite well for you. And it's going to shave down. You mentioned, uh, you know, not having to carry extra gear. I've seen people mm-hmm. set up standard trackers and, um, they got to get the laser out. It's like a 10 minute process where with the K1, I could, I think it may be two minutes. It takes me because I'll do a three access rotation on the GPS calibration. I'll do a three access rotation to do the Astro tracer calibration. 99.9% of the time I get a lock and I'm, I'm good to go and I'm up yeah. and running. And I've been out with people that were still hitting the North star with a laser, trying to get that part of it up and running. But that does give a camera without Astro tracer, the ability to duplicate that process. Yeah. Um, no, we, we also touched upon, oh no, we didn't, we didn't talk about weather sealing, did we? We did not. Oh my gosh. So, wow. Uh, Pentax makes weather sealing better than really most camera manufacturers do. Um, they have quite a reputation for robust cameras and actually in 2012, Alex Jansen piled sand, piled sand on his Pentax cameras to demonstrate their resistance to dust. And then he rinsed them off by ru- um, uh, by running uh, running it running a shower on it. Just just to I did prove. not know about this. Yeah, no, it's it's pretty pretty remarkable. Um, uh, another guy named Student Richard, um, he uh, smeared mud all over the outside and then washed it off in a faucet. So he's <laughs> uh, Alex Jansen's not the only one who's done it. So in both tests, the cameras were fully functional afterwards. Now. Have either of you tried these tests yet? I have not. Okay. I, 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 in, um, 2019, I think it was 2019. I tried the, um, asphalt test and it failed. Well, yeah. nobody ever said that it was. No, asphalt. no, it's not a feature. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's not a feature. It's yeah. Weather sealing. Uh, it's not built by Fisher price. So, right. Exactly. And I I might need something like that. Yeah. Uh, I I will say this. uh, I shoot in environments that cause rust pretty quickly because uh, most of my tripods, all the little, all the little um, nuts and bolts start to rust within usually a few months of me picking it up because I'm out at the beach. You know, I just have very salty air near here. It's true. Yeah. It was a huge, yeah, it was a huge relief. Not that I've had pro, I haven't had any serious issues with any camera equipment. Like that 6D I had, as soon as I got it in, I immediately put, they make like a rubber, they made like a rubber jacket for it that I put on immediately. Um, but it's just, it's nice peace of mind to know that it really is. I'm going to be okay. I'm not doing underwater photography, but the humidity, like tonight, the humidity is almost 80% here. It's yeah. more tropical than you think. I just, I don't worry about it. Yeah, and I've, I've had the same issue where I've been out a few times, and you know, there's so much humidity going on, you're wiping the lens off. So it's nice to not even have to worry about. Okay, I gotta make sure the the camera body itself is dry. You can just forget about that, and make sure the lens is clean, and go at it. And the three of us photograph in deserts too, where it can get really windy sometimes. So there's that. 
Yeah. 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 I'd read something years ago about somebody who was um, not quite sold on the Sony mirrorless. Now, now this has changed because this was a while ago. Right. About using uh, those cameras out in um, dirty, sandy environments because things were creeping in. They just didn't have... They had like a basic weather ceiling, but not not something that would prohibit that. And obviously that's changed at this point. But I feel like other companies are catching up to to Pentax. Yeah. Pentax yeah. is, uh, yeah, I mean, they've been uh, known for this for a while as evidenced by Alex Jansen's story, you know, which was 2012. So um, I want to say this, this is subjective too, but I think I think the Pentax K1 feels perfect in my hands. You know, I have large hands and mm -hmm. it's it's a decent sized camera and it also weighs a lot because you don't have all that tech and weather sealing and not pay a slight weight price for that. So that's just what happens. But it, so it is a slightly heavy camera, but um, it, it just feels great in the hands. Not that we have it in our hands for long because the three of us uh, photograph <laughs> with tripods. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I know that there's going to be people out there who say, well, you know, that's the great thing about mirrorless is it's so light and they're so easy to, do. and that that's fine. But I have right. no qualms about carrying a, just a beefy, bulky metal alloy camera. Like I, I I'm of that old school mentality that the things that are durable and quality are heavy. You know, and I, I know that that's not the case these days with a, with a lot of things. But when I go out and shoot in a rugged environment, I want to feel like I got a rugged environment tool and, you know, mirrorless. I, and this is not a DSLR better than mirrorless, whatever. But I don't want to get down that path because that's a whole no. other discussion. But I don't have any interest in mirrorless um, feature wise. I'm very happy with what I have. Oh, and, and that's something else that I just want to throw at you. You know, camera technology over time, I feel has, has, I don't want to say plateaued. You know, I've said this before in conversations we've had, it, it's the, 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 the jump from this camera to the next year's model is, is not so steep anymore, you know, where you could hold on to a camera body for a very long time and be very satisfied with what yeah. you have. The, the analogy I use with a lot of people is like, okay, you've got a 4k TV in your house now. And they're coming out with 6k okay you know does it really matter to you at that point yeah, not, you know we're not yeah, going from point, it's almost irrelevant we're not going from analog tv to 4k we're going from 4k to 6k and that tv might only be 40 inches and you're not going to notice the difference and i feel that way about the pentax like i'm completely satisfied i don't have camera envy anymore mm -hmm. like i used to on occasion if somebody shows up like a sony a7 III. It's a fantastic camera. And I look at that and I say, good for you for owning that. That camera looks awesome. I love my Pentax. And it's well, old. You know, really, <laughs> it, the, the Pentax, you get a lot of bang for your buck because mm -hmm. they're not incredibly expensive. If, you know, if you're looking at the 36 megapixels and either a Nikon or a Canon, you're paying a whole lot more for that than you are for Pentax. Yeah. And it's got all these really pretty cool features. And, and you know, why not? It, it's, it works great. It's got a lot of things that are really handy. And, uh, you know, a lot of times somebody that's got, especially, uh, you know, like they want to have the, the Sony mirrorless because it's so light and they go out, say, California in the desert where the wind's blowing, what's the first thing they're going to do after they set the camera up on there, they're going to hang a bag off the bottom side of the tripod to keep it stable. Pentax weighs so much. Who needs? <laughs> who cares? It's not going anywhere. <laughs> it's already pushing down. Well, so there's an un unwritten feature. It it is an excellent um, auxiliary self defense weapon. Exactly. That's right. That's right. Yeah, we we no, all I, shot I, in I environments do. where there's coyotes. So. Yep. Certainly. I do yeah. have an interest in in mirrorless, and you know I've got my eye on the Nikon Z9 and things like that, which mm -hmm. which has some really remarkable low light focus among other features. Um, but I'm really really happy with the K1 uh, and its feature set, so so I'm going to use that for the foreseeable future. If, for me, that Astro Tracer functionality is like the golden the golden egg. On, on all of the features because mm -hmm. um, it's integrated and 
I don't know about you guys, but when I first started doing photography, I, I kept buying more and more stuff and I'd start carrying more and more stuff. And then I'd be rolling through airports with a giant Pelican case and like, look at all yeah. my stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, thanks. And now I'm just like, how, how little can I bring tonight and get what I need to get done? Right. And, um, I've done, I've done so much now with the tracking, which I, I personally feel like is the absolute way to go when you do, um, Astro stuff that I don't think I could go back to a camera that didn't have that feature set. And I certainly don't want to throw on a, um, a manual, uh, a secondary tracker underneath the camera and then do all that. Cause that'll, that'll kind of take some of the enjoyment out of it for me. So I, I, I plan on keeping my K1 and, until it doesn't function anymore. Or it, it, something goes wrong and it, and it can't be fixed. And, and then I'll just try to find another one <laughs> at that point. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe there'll be a, I don't know, maybe there'll be a Mark III that comes out eventually. Who knows? There'll be some weird feature that we haven't even thought of yet. But to back to your original mm -hmm. point, they do, they, they do seem like they thought about some things and said, what can we offer some of these people that they're not getting elsewhere? Even if Absolutely. it's something that only 10 people would like, you know, <laughs> um, I forget about the body lighting. And then when I rediscover it, I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. I have this. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I love it. <laughs> It's a great yeah, feature. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty cool. And really, the, you know, the way that the uh, the screen on the back there, how you can flip it up, down, sideways, uh, it, it's fantastic because if you don't have that, you know, you take a low angle shot, you've got to really get down there and, you know, get your chin in the ground so you can mm -hmm. see the screen. Whereas with this, you can just flip it up and look right there. That's it is the definitely other thing. A nice feature. Terribly handy. It, it is because I've taken a lot of shots from the ground before with the uh, cameras that don't have those screens, and it's mm -hmm. a huge pain in the butt. And it is. Um, and and just to be clear, if, if you don't own one of these or you haven't seen one before, it's not a fully articulating, articulating screen. Like you can't. Yeah, you can't do like the selfies with it. it. Doesn't flip around. Right. So that you can see it from the front, but you do get a whole bunch of different angles. And there's a fair amount of videos I've seen where people are you know, they're dangling the camera from it just to prove how durable it is. You know, I wouldn't recommend it, but if for some no. reason your camera was dropping and you grabbed that to stop it, you could <laughs> just rip the screen off, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but well, that's well, a nice, a lot though, because of how much it weighs. Oh yeah. You that's, put that. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, you put that with a 15 to 30 and then you yeah. put that on one of the heavy tripods that we use to make sure we don't get any shake. And you've got a full workout program. Absolutely. Yeah. One yeah, absolutely. last thing. One last thing I want to mention that we haven't really touched upon yet is that um, people are always saying, "Oh, you know, there's not a ton of um, uh, Pentax lenses compared to Canon and Nikon," and that's probably true. But uh, the Pentax came out; it's been around since 1975. So there's actually quite a lot of legacy lenses and quite a lot of lenses that you can pick up for really cheap. So for instance, I picked up an, and we, you know, I'm sure this is a future episode, but I picked up a hundred millimeter macro lens, um, for free because this one guy couldn't, he, he literally couldn't give it away. And I've picked up, um, a 50 millimeter F, uh, F four macro as well. Um, that I think I only spent, I, f I forgot what it was. It was, it was about 40 or $50. So you're getting legacy lenses, but they're high quality mm -hmm. legacy lenses. And we've, we've also talked, uh, all three of us, I believe own the 28 to 105, which came out in 2016 paired with the K1. And that's just a brilliant lens, especially for only $500 new 300 used. So. And. Yeah. and with Astro Trace, it doesn't matter that it doesn't go down to two point eight because now you've got time time on your side and you can shoot at three, five, four, four, five and and be fine with it. Right. So there's quite a few lenses that you can use with Astro Tracing because of because of what you say. Oh, and the body has the in camera stabilization, so you don't have to worry about picking up stabilized lenses. Right. Either, that doesn't matter. Is, it's a yeah. cost savings. Um, on the lens side of it, I picked up a 135 from. Uh, That's right. God. That's right. I can't remember the name of it. I think it started with an with an A. It was from the 70s. I think the lens is as old as I am. But 135 millimeters is a is a really nice focal length. I've just started to dabble in some deep sky astro stuff, and it's it's just perfect for that. Um, but it's also really light, and I paid 
I think $40 for it through KEH. And they have, uh, I bought a bunch of stuff from them before. Uh, this is not a sponsored video, but they have a ton of uh, Pentax lenses that I've seen down there um, available on, on uh, the vintage side and relatively cheap. So if you just want to experiment, you're not out a lot of money and you could probably turn it around pretty quick. Mm -hmm.